This is BBC News. I'm Geetha Goramuthi. The headlines at 11. Hong Kong's leadership backs down indefinitely after mass protests over their controversial extradition law. The Foreign Secretary criticizes Jeremy Corbyn for questioning whether the government has credible evidence that Iran was behind attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman. A major review of hospital food after the deaths of five patients from Listeria is announced in England. Lincolnshire flooding, people forced to leave their homes are still waiting to learn when they can return. After two months' rain fell in two days. And the climb down by Hong Kong's leaders and just who will be Britain's next Prime Minister. Lively debate in Dateline London in half an hour here on BBC News. Hello. Hong Kong's suspended plans to introduce a controversial new law allowing extraditions to mainland China. The proposals had prompted the biggest protests in the territory for years. The government had previously argued that the extradition bill would plug the loopholes so that the city would not be a safe haven for criminals following a murder case in Taiwan. But critics argued it would expose people in Hong Kong to China's unfair justice system. Well, Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam, said the priority now was to restore peace and order. After our repeated internal deliberations over the last two days, I now announce that the government has decided to suspend the legislative amendment exercise, restart our communication with all sectors of society, do more explanation work and listen to different views of society. I want to stress that the government is adopting an open mind to heed comprehensively different views in society towards the bill. The Secretary for Security will send a letter to the Legislative Council President to withdraw the notice of resumption of a second reading debate on the bill. In other words, the Council will halt its work in relation to the bill until our work in communication, explanation and listening to opinions is completed. We have no intention to set a deadline for this work and promise to report to and consult members of the Legislative Council panel on security before we decide on the next step forward. Well, let's get the latest now from our correspondent Martin Yip, who is in Hong Kong. This looks like a major climb down, Martin. Climb down or not, is, it really depends on, on your perspective. Uh, what I can tell you, the very latest is even after Carrie Lam has now announced that she will suspend this uh, bill amendment, see for Human Rights Front, which is the organizer for the rally back on last Sunday, where they claimed more than a million people have been on the street, has. Uh, has told the press that they will go ahead again with a new rally tomorrow on Sunday. And even before that, in the morning when the, this rumor that Carrie Lam would came out, which now she did, she did uh, to announce the suspension, I've seen many posts on the internet, on Facebook and Twitter saying they will still go to uh, a march, the march that is planned for tomorrow, because what people are asking for uh, in the pro-democracy camp is a full withdrawal of the bill, which is not the case at the moment. And yes, uh, is there any sign that that might happen if this is delayed for a significant period of time that ultimately the authorities will, will think, OK, there's mass protest, that is not something they want to repeat of? Uh, looks like this is really not the case at the moment. But yes, Carrie Lam did say she would now uh, try to reopen up uh, explanation mainly uh, to the public as well as uh, different sectors of the society. So hopefully we can expect some sort of a uh, dialogue between the government with uh, all stakeholders, if you like, uh, of this case. Uh, but there's still no signs of backing down at all. Uh, for example, during the press conference when she announced this uh, suspension, many journalists have been asking whether she would uh, like to withdraw uh, the phrase rouse that has been used to describe the clashes. Uh, uh, over the past few days, but she mentioned nothing about withdrawing this description of rioting, uh, which means somehow she's still being defiant. Okay, Martin Yip, thank you very much.
Iran is almost certainly responsible for the attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Amman, according to the Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt. Yesterday, the U.S. military released a video which it said showed Iranian forces removing an unexploded mine from one of the stricken ships. Tehran has denied any involvement. The Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, says there's no credible evidence from Iran that they are responsible, tweeting that the UK should ease tensions rather than fuel a military escalation. Well, earlier I spoke to our political correspondent Nick Erdley about Jeremy Corbyn's tweet. He wants to see more evidence. He tweeted last night that he doesn't at this moment think there is credible evidence to say that Iran was definitely responsible for this. That's a view that's been echoed this morning by Labour's Shadow Foreign Secretary Emily Thornberry. Let's have a listen to what she told the Today programme. These are extremely dangerous developments and we really have to pause and think about where we are going next. The idea that we're going to get enmeshed in another war is something that we really need to think about very carefully. Now, the government's view is very similar to the one of the United States. It thinks Iran was almost certainly responsible for this. And we have heard again this morning from the Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt on social media attacking Mr Corbyn for questioning that assessment, saying that Mr Corbyn's views were pathetic and predictable and uh, arguing that Mr Corbyn wasn't listening to British intelligence or acting in British interests. Now, there is the obvious difference between the two. Mr Corbyn has always been sceptical of some British military intelligence. Mr Hunt is, of course, standing for the Conservative leadership. I think you've got to see in that context as well. Yes, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn um, saying, yes, we, the Britain should act to ease tensions and uh, the government's rhetoric will only increase the threat of war. Critics of Corbyn saying, well, look, he cast doubts over the Skripal poisoning and other incidents and actually everyone's got to be very careful. I mean, key is, that, of course, the intelligence links between the UK and the US. The UK does have really strong links. It tends to get a lot of first sight, doesn't it, which actually other European nations don't necessarily get. Yes, absolutely. We, we, we know that relationship is strong. We know that there will have been conversations about what exactly the US knows about this. We know that the Foreign Office here has carried out its own assessments as well and come to that conclusion. Labour, though, just isn't convinced there is enough evidence there. It says it hasn't seen enough evidence, that it wants more to be put out there before it can uh, agree with that assessment that Iran was more than likely responsible. There is a broader point here that the two sides have different views about the, uh, the strategic approach to Iran, and the Labour Party is very concerned that uh, an escalation here could lead to quite a destabilising conflict in the Middle East. The government is worried about that too. Jeremy Hunt has made clear he doesn't want that to happen. But for now, they're much more likely, the government that is, to side with the United States on this. Nick Erdley there. We can speak now to Mohammed Morandi, a professor at Tehran University. Um, professor, would you ac accept that intelligence uh, from the US and UK tends to be um, you know, very powerful and that governments would not make these statements of blame if they weren't sure? Yes, we saw that during the Iraq war in 2003 when Colin Powell went to the UN Security Council and provided uh, a load of evidence to show that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. And it later turned out to be a lie. And the international community even then knew that the United States was lying. And so therefore we have zero respect or trust in anything that comes out of Washington. Well, fact, I, don't, I, don't know if, I don't know if the international community would accept that they, they knew that the US was lying. And it, it is, it's, you know, people have learned from any previous errors. It's, it's not good for any government to be found out afterwards to be saying something that's not based on credible evidence. No, they were lying. And those who were involved in Iraq from on behalf of the UN, those who were looking and involved with nuclear weapons and those who are involved in chemical weapons knew very well that there was no evidence and the Americans were basically gunning for war. That's, that's beyond a doubt and I think your audience knows that quite well. And in fact, Pompeo, the current Secretary of State of the United States, just recently gave a speech when he said when he was the head of the CIA, he said, we lied, we cheated and we stole. And he was very open about that. So why in the world would we trust anything that comes out of Washington? Indeed, it's very interesting that 
the media and think tanks in the United States and in your country are always skeptical of Trump calling him a serial liar. But when it comes to countries like Iran, everything that he says is accepted without question. Some small black and white clip is shown on TV and somehow that is evidence that the American narrative is the legitimate narrative. And we all also, by the way, forget that the United States is engaging in economic warfare against ordinary Iranians. And your country is abiding by the dictates of Donald Trump, even though your country has signed a nuclear deal committing itself to normalizing the relationship with Iran. Well, a, a number of countries in the West are obviously keen to maintain the progress that was made with Iran. And in terms of the actual video footage here, the point that is made by the US and others is that um, it, only the Iranians would have the expertise and the know-how to go and, and do that mine removal operation. And nobody else is operating in that stretch of water. And that is why they say that evidence points to Iranian involvement. So, what you're basically saying is that the Iranians don't have the in, in know-how to remove a mine, yet they are a threat to the international community. On the one hand, the Iranians are incompetent and ca incapable, yet somehow they're they're a, a threat to peace and stability across the region. That's, no, no. I think the point was the point the Americans are making is that because the Iranians were operating on that boat, you know at all, and that's what that video footage shows, they say that points to Iranian involvement. That boat was near Iranian territorial waters. The Iranians went to rescue the people who were calling for help. And by the way, the Japanese companies, the company that owns one of the boats, says there weren't uh, mines involved. And the, and the mine that was supposedly, and we don't see anything in specific in the clip, the, the mine that was supposedly removed was well above the water. What would a mine be doing well above the water? The, the narrative coming out of Washington is completely inconsistent with what the Japanese are saying. And also their own narrative is inconsistent. On the one hand, they say that Iranian boats were rushing towards the ships before the attack. And yet they say they, 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 were, they were removing mines. Well, the mines would have been put there well before those boats were moving towards the ship. It's, okay. it's ridiculous. Professor Morandi, it's utterly ridiculous. Professor Morandi from Tehran University, thanks very much indeed. Now, a comprehensive review of hospital food in England has been announced by the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock. It's in response to the deaths of five patients who contracted listeria. Seven NHS trusts have been affected by the outbreak, which has been linked to pre-packed sandwiches and salads. Simon Jones reports. With nine confirmed cases of listeria in hospital patients, resulting in five deaths, the health secretary wants to know what's gone wrong. Two people lost their lives at the Manchester Royal Infirmary, one at Aintree Hospital. It's not been revealed where the other two patients died. In a statement, the health secretary said, I have been incredibly concerned by this issue and strongly believe that we need a radical new approach to the food that is served in our NHS. Here at the Department of Health, Matt Hancock was facing growing calls to act. Labour now wants him to make an urgent statement to the Commons on Monday to outline what exactly is being done. They say hospital patients and staff alike need reassurance. 43 NHS trusts had been supplied sandwiches and salads from a company called the Good Food Chain, which has been linked to the outbreak. It got its sandwich fillings from North Country Cooked Meats. It's here that a strain of listeria has been identified. Both have halted production. The first patient affected showed symptoms on the 25th of April. Suspect sandwiches and salads were withdrawn on the 25th of May. Public Health England first warned about the outbreak on the 7th of June. Listeria typically causes mild food poisoning, but can prove fatal if people are already seriously ill. It's probably the nastiest of all the foodborne bugs. Um, nastiest in the sense that it does have this uh, ability to target vulnerable people and unfortunately kill them, uh, you know, far more than even nasty bugs like E. coli 157. As investigations continue, Public Health England insists any risk to the public remains low. Simon Jones, BBC News. 
Now, six candidates remain in the race to be the next leader of the Conservative Party and the next Prime Minister to replace Theresa May. Health Secretary Matt Hancock pulled out of the contest yesterday but is yet to declare who he, and more importantly perhaps his supporters, will now back. Well, former Foreign Secretary and Mayor of London Boris Johnson remains the front runner and has confirmed that he will take part in a BBC televised leadership debate. Let's recap on exactly who the candidates are who have made it to the next stage. As mentioned, the front runner Boris Johnson, of course, the former London Mayor and Foreign Secretary. Then there is Michael Gove, currently Environment Secretary, ran against Boris in the last contest and he is running again. Another favourite is the previous Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, now of course the Foreign Secretary. Also running is Sajid Javid, the current Home Secretary, and Dominic Raab, former Brexit Secretary, who quit over May's withdrawal bill. And finally, Rory Stewart, the International Development Secretary. Well, those are the candidates, but what do we know about the people who actually get to choose them? The fate of the next Conservative leader will be decided by around 160,000 Tory members. And research has confirmed that 70% of party members are male and 97% are white British. The average age is 57, although over 40% of the group is aged 65 or above. Well, joining us now are Lee Petman, who is chair of the Slough Tory Association, joining us from Slough, and also by Alexander Curtis, who's chair of Hartford and Stortford Conservative Association, joining us from a Conservative conference in central London. Thanks both for joining us. Alex Curtis, if I can just ask you, who are you supporting and what are your members saying? I mean... Um, there's definitely diversity of opinion amongst members that I've spoken to both in my constituency and elsewhere in the country, but both the people I've spoken to and, well, and me, um, we're, we're all supporting Boris Johnson by and large. And uh, Lee Petman, can I ask you, who's, who's your vote going to? Yeah, I think it's very interesting here in Slough because obviously Boris is a next-door neighbour constituency MP. Um, and he fought really hard on issues like Heathrow. Um, so I think there's a mixture of opinion, but it seems to be that Brexit being the most important issue of the day, most people in Leave voting Slough are, are looking like they're going to support Boris. And what are the issues that people are voting on? I mean, do they, for example, are they following whether Boris Johnson or any of the others will actually deliver Brexit by the end of October? Or if that looks impossible, you know, does that concern them? Yeah, uh, uh, we, uh, we've been out on the streets uh, over the last couple of weeks and we're going out again in the next few weeks to talk to residents to ask them what they really think. And to be honest, Brexit is at the top of their agenda. You know, they really want this delivered now. And I think given the, Bor the Boris's stances, you know, we get to the 31st and no matter what we want to leave, I think that's going down really well with most of the public. And to be honest, that's what they voted for. Um, so I, I would be very surprised if we don't get the right level of support for Boris. And Alex Curtis, are you getting a similar reaction, crucially, from the Conservative members? Because those are the people who've actually got the vote. Um, yes, so there's that Brexit bre bre aspect. And we, we know we're not all, not everyone in the Conservative Party is a Leaver, admittedly. Um, but the vast majority, whether they voted Remain or Leave, they now think we need to just get on with it and get it done. And Boris. Um, they feel is the person who's going to do that. Uh, but beyond that, I think that we need a leader. And I think that's what people are saying within the party. We need someone who has that charisma, who is likeable, who can actually, you know, who gets under people's skin, who be, you know, people, be, make people want to like them. Um, and Boris is that person, Boris is that human. Um, and that really is what we're going for. I think we're going to be going for in this leadership election. And that's and are most of your members... Are most of your members um, happy with, do they want a no-deal exit by the end of October if a deal is not possible? Because the EU have consistently been saying that they're not going to extend. And even if there is an extension, it's, it's obviously still very difficult to see how any deal is done. So do your members say, OK, regardless of the economic consequences of a no-deal exit, that's what they want? Well, I think that, frankly, no one... Well, very few people want actively want a no-deal exit, but if that's the only way we're going to leave, I think we'd rather have a no-deal exit than three more wasted on Brexit at the expense of all other issues. I think the economic harm caused by that is perhaps greater 
than that admittedly caused by a no deal Brexit in the medium term. And what about um, other people who could come come up? Obviously, in the last two. First mm -hmm. of all, I mean, do you, do you and your members want a contest if Boris Johnson does come out in front uh, in the last two, and it looks as though he's still polling a majority of membership? You know, would a coronation and a quick resolution be something that you would support? That we don't want a coronation. We saw what happened last time where we had a coronation. We don't want another coronation. Um, look, um, not all members are going to be voting for Boris. I mean, in my association, I, there are a number of people who, who wouldn't be. Um, who would they vote for instead? Who, where well, are the votes going? You know, it depends on who gets to the final two. Rory Stewart seems some traction. Um, Jeremy Hunt as well. My MPs uh, backing Jeremy Hunt. Um, you know, Jeremy's got lots of very good qualities, as, do, as does Rory, even though I disagree with him on the Brexit question. Um, they've got very good qualities themselves. So it's not going to be a coronation. I don't think Boris should be taking anything for granted. Yes, he's a front runner, but um, there's going to be a con there's still going to be a contest. OK, uh, and Lee, Lee Petman, if I can just go back to you. Uh, yeah. What about you and your members? Would you like a coronation? No, I don't think so. I think it's about time that the party had a proper contest. Uh, the last time we had a proper contest was 2008. Um, obviously, last time when Theresa May became Prime Minister, it, w it was without the members' consent. And, and, and I think just it's very really quick, important this time that we do that. Very quickly, if it's not Boris Johnson, who would your vote be for? Uh, I think me personally, it would be Michael Gove. But I think uh, in the membership, as, uh, um, as Alex has alluded to, I think there's a lot of interest for all the candidates. OK, Lee Petman and Alex Curtis, really interesting to talk to you both. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Let's get all the sport now. Here's Mike. Keita, good morning again. Thank you. England have qualified for the last 16 with Thomas Schaffernacker. Hello. Well, if you like this cool, showery weather, I guess it's good news for you. It looks as though it's going to continue for, for quite some time. Uh, tomorrow might be a little on the chilly side around some western and southern coasts. The breeze is going to pick up. Uh, coming off the uh, Atlantic. So the low pressure is very much with us today. You can see the clouds circling around the low pressure, weather fronts too, and this pattern has been stuck across the UK for, for a long time now, and for as long as this low pressure is here, the weather isn't going to change. It's cool across northwestern parts of Europe, central, southern, eastern areas, even Scandinavia at the moment uh, in, in the midst of a uh, relentless uh, heat wave. So through today, this is where the showers are around lunchtime, southern parts of the UK nudging into the Midlands, the northwest of England, a few showers in Scotland too. It's been raining so far today across the east of Northern Ireland, but the anticipation is that later on in the day um, it's going to be um, much, uh, much brighter and temperatures will probably get up to around about uh, 19 degrees at best. The showers will continue their journey eastwards through the course of this evening and then uh, later on many of us actually uh, having some clear skies uh, during the evening. Temperatures first thing on Sunday will hover from around about uh, 8 degrees in Belfast to maybe 12 degrees uh, in the um, uh, uh, very far south of the UK there. So Sunday, the low pressure is still with us here, so it's basically like a broken record. Um, the weather fronts keep marching in our direction, so basically that just spells a showery day for, for a lot of us. And here's the breeze then, a southwesterly breeze uh, around western and southern coasts. Frequent clouds and showers moving through. You see plenty of them across uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland too. Temperatures might get up to 20 degrees, but I suspect in the breeze it's going to feel a little bit uh, cooler. Uh, than that. A little change into Monday. Again, lots of showers around. It's just that they'll be in different places. The thinking is probably more frequent showers in Western Scotland and also Northern Ireland, whereas few, fewer showers in, in Wales and England, perhaps a little bit warmer too. Now, the good news is if you want something a little bit warmer, it will be turning a bit warmer during the course of the week. But after that, it looks as though things will cool off once again. That's it from me. Bye-bye. Hello and welcome to Dateline London. I'm Carrie Gracie. This week, Hong Kong in tears, Gulf tankers in flames and Britain's Marmite man in pole position to become the next Prime Minister. My guest today, Chinese writer Diane Weiliang. 
UK political commentator Steve Richards, Agnes Poirier of French News Weekly Marianne, and American journalist Michael Goldfarb of the podcast FRDH. Welcome to you all. So Hong Kong wept last week. Its leader, Carrie Lam, well, she was in tears because so many of her citizens distrusted her assurances on a new extradition law and took to the streets instead in protest. The protesters wept because they'd been tear gassed by police, but their determination paid off. This weekend, the government suspended its plans for the extradition bill and said it would listen. So what next for the unique and fragile ecosystem that is Hong Kong? Diane, let's just uh, come to you first and ask what happened here, because this looks like a dramatic U-turn from a government which, even as late as Wednesday, was signalling defiance in, and, and sending out police with rubber bullets and threats. It is, in some ways, a surprising move if we look at the 2014 Yellow Umbrella movement and the standoff month and the Hong Kong government in, in the end won, if you could uh, prefer that term. And just most recently was the 30th anniversary of Tiananmen democracy movement, and we know how that ended. So in well, way, that was Beijing rather than Hong Kong, which of course is supposed to have autonomy yes. under the one country, two systems. And however, that autonomy, as we have been watching, has been eroded over time. So this is one country, two system. It's not absolute terms. So in a way, it was slightly surprising that Carrie Lam stepped down and postponed this vote. What is interesting is that overnight, she was reported to have cross border to Shenzhen, met with the minister for Hong Kong from Beijing, and no one knew how, what they discussed. But my suspicion is this is the, you, the people's power and the demonstrators are winning this round, but also a was sort of the result of international pressure. For example, Donald Trump had indicated that he could bring this up at G20 meeting with Xi Jinping in two, months, two weeks' time in the big context of China-U.S. trade war. And the U.S. Congress had also passed a bill and to assess annually Hong Kong's special trade status with the U.S. And so lots of different active groups. We'll come back to we'll come back to the international dimension in a moment, but just to look at the action on the streets of Hong Kong, I suppose what was really noticeable on this occasion was the support that the protesters had, both from elements in the business community, the legal community. It wasn't just young students, was it? That was important um, for any scholars of Chinese history. And you, you, China has had a long history of student-led movement that ended up in failure. And you, in 30 years ago, when the students went to Tiananmen Square, the big learning was we must do something that was different than the May 4th movement in 1919, which was to involve the whole of community, the workers, the civil servants, because student-only protests had never succeeded in China. I think this is a, one of the examples that showed in Hong Kong with broader support and the voices of young people just became stronger. Steve, let's look at the UK dimension briefly because um, obviously the UK has treaty obligations to Hong Kong until 2047, this 50-year period of autonomy, one country, two systems. But the UK was fairly slow, the British government fairly slow to get involved in talking about this extradition bill. I mean, really only since we've seen so many people on the streets. Do you think that was fear of Beijing or do you think that was misreading the mood in Hong Kong? Both of those, but also there's a, basically a vacuum in Britain at the moment. I mean, the, the ministers aren't behaving normally. So, for example, the Foreign Secretary is involved in a leadership contest. And I don't think uh, ministerial minds are focused very much on anything else. We're going on to Iran in a moment. And I think the same, to some extent, applies there. So it's partly that. It's partly the fact that it's trying to manage, in a way, uh, a, an arrangement that worked theoretically at the time, but will be constantly challenged in practice, because the power lies with China. 
and it's a constant, I think, will be a constant balancing out. So a combination where I think eyes are off the ball at the moment in the UK, plus a constant reading about where power really lies. It lies probably, even though this protest you say was successful, with the Chinese government. And, and Agnes, while we're, while we're doing the kind of people confused by leadership elections, there's obviously leadership kind of change going on in Europe. Um, do you think the underlying issues are the same as those that Steve's mentioned in relation to the UK, that kind of assessment of forces on each side? Yes, and also, I mean, you know, and, and the French citizens speaking here, it always pays off to take to the street. And the first round is victory for the people of Hong Kong. So that's a great uh, thing to, to see from Europe. Uh, but it's also, you know, from we're so far away and we know or we fear that Hong Kong is doomed eventually, that, um, you know, there's China, there's democratic China that is actually Hong Kong. But in 28 years, you know, it's going to be complete, completely China. And already we know that some businessmen um, are moving their assets abroad and, and basically Singapore and Japan are, are going to welcome that uh, very international community with a lot of... Um, alert, ties to, to uh, you know, Canada and Europe and, and America, and it looks as if, um, if you look back just five years ago, the, the umbrella movement, there was um, an optimism about it. But although we are very far away, we've seen, we're seeing this from far away, I can only see despair, really, and pessimism in Hong Kong, despite that great victory. So if we t we're taking a long view, it looks to me it's, it's the last battle of Hong Kong, really. Michael, what do you think the US makes of all of this? I mean, Agnes Mentor says this is democratic China, but of course, actually, there's only very limited democracy in Hong Kong. More democratic China is actually Taiwan, if you want to talk about meaningful. I mean, wh how does the US see all these political and financial and economic forces aligned? Well, you say the US. We, we have to really be specific and say, how does the Trump administration see things? And, you know, who knows? One of the problems with the chaotic international leadership of the Trump administration is that you just don't know. I mean, I'm sure that this would be, will be used as a chip in any negotiations going on with China where there's trade war growing and we hear every week there's two or three different stories coming from one side or the other about, oh, we're going to raise tariffs here, we'll raise tariffs there, and this side's getting angry, that side's getting angry. I don't think democracy really enters into it. If the people in Hong Kong, if the brave, and, and can I just say how remarkable it is? You know, we, my Twitter feed is full of hashtag resistors who send out nasty things about Donald Trump and think they're f striking a blow for democracy. A million people from all walks of life went out into the streets. We saw the pictures. They were not met with flowers. And let's say that this is an action for democracy. I think that in, in the Trump administration, it becomes, oh, well, this is a chip to play. Mm -hmm. This is a, or a, another sporting metaphor. I mean, Hong Kong doesn't want to be the football being kicked between the People's Republic of China and the United States. And I do fear that, because I haven't read anything about this in, from American Congress people or anything, that this is an action of democracy. It's something else, mm. if they're paying attention at all. Um, I mean, I should probably just say on the, on the numbers, just to, just to qualify that a little bit, that that is obviously the numbers that the protesters said they had on the street and the police said they had far fewer. But we saw the pictures. We saw the pictures. Um, Diane, I want, to take, I want to take us now to um, Beijing and its strategic objectives and how it sees its strategic direction in Hong Kong, because this must be a very difficult moment for a, a Chinese Communist Party which likes to see itself as unassailable, invincible, and likes to look like that on the street. Which they believe they are, and still. And what it is, is see, they see this as a setback, but also in the short term is strategic because they have the Donald Trump meeting, the G20, they have the trade war, they have bigger fish to fry. And on the other hand, over time, I have to agree with Agnes that you will see Hong Kong deteriorating this sort of autonomy. And we already seen it happen. In this particular protest, people are already behaving very much 
like as if they were in China. They don't talk to journalists. They don't want to give their names. They wear masks so that they would not be photographed. Because they fear long-term victimization. Absolutely. And so it's very different from yellow umbrellas because the leaders of that movement all had been jailed. So Hong Kong is becoming more and more like China. And China knows. China has it's playing a long arms. game. Absolutely. OK, we're going to have to leave that issue there because uh, we've got to talk about Iran now. As on May the 12th, so on June the 13th, except bigger attacks on two tankers in shipping's most sensitive choke point. Now, this time with fires that forced the crews of both ships to evacuate. The U.S. said Iran was responsible. On Friday, it released grainy video to back up that charge. Iran hotly denies it. An aircraft carrier strike force is close by. Michael, how do you read this situation? Well, I mean, I think this is just probably an escalation of two long-term anta antagonists um, who at the moment, uh, my guess is, because in Washington we know that the we want a war with Iran faction is actually in the White House now. John Bolton, um, Mike Pompeo, who probably doesn't know much about it, but is following John Bolton, the Secretary of State and, and the National Security Advisor. Um, so they're pushing for aggressive action. And do you and, think and they the, really want a war? Or is uh, no, it no, this is, I, I, I'm, no I, I think that this is what we're... I don't think they really want a war. I think they'd love to have regime change if they could. Um, they can't. Um, and then, you know, in Iran, you have the... the Revolutionary Guards, and they have factions within. We don't get to know much about it because it's not possible to operate as journalists in Iran and really explain what's going on. So you might just have two hardline factions bumping up against each other. But the war question is really what's important here because a lot of people get upset. Oh, we're going to have war. Um, I just remind people that, you know, Iran kidnapped 52 American diplomats and kept them hostage for a year. That's a casus belli. We didn't go to war. They blew up 250 plus Marines in Beirut. That's a casus belli. They didn't go to war. And on and on over the last 40 years. I think that where we are now is just a lot of tension and it may well increase incrementally. But, you know, the, the, we never think about the other player here, which is Russia. Iran and Russia are involved in Syria and intimately connected. Geographically, they are intimately connected. It's only a 500-mile drive from uh, Russia's ca main western Caspian seaport down to Iran. If you put all these factors together, you think, well, if Russia wants to intervene here, is there going to be a war? No, but there will be tension, and I think that's where we're So are. that's the great game that you've set out, and obviously there's, on the other side, Saudi Arabia, um, the UAE, and, and various other regional rivals. Um, but, but on the direct question of who actually attacked these tankers... Well, you know, I, I really worry about the rush. I mean, you would think all signs point to Iran. I mean, even the Foreign Office today said, uh, or yesterday, Jeremy Hunt said... On a balance, we, we think it's Iran. Um, but Steve just eloquently and briefly pointed out that nobody's really paying much attention at, at that level in the British government, so they may just be echoing America. You have to say, who benefits from doing this? And you think, well, they didn't sink anything. They made a point. The Japanese owner of one of the tankers said, actually, it wasn't landmines. It was something that flew in and hit the side of the vessel. And it happened on a day when the Japanese prime minister was in Tehran. Tehran. Exactly. So you think everybody's making points. And, and you know, you have the G... We, we've spoken about the G20 meeting. You know, at the end of this month, there's meant to be a big meeting in Bahrain where we're going to discuss... Where we, not me, um, where, where the U.S. is going to present its plan for Israel-Palestine peace. I just think... You know, it, it's about getting attention. And Lord knows we're talking about it, so they've got attention. And, and Agnes, what about the European perspective on this? Are the Europeans this weekend blaming Iran or are they blaming the Trump administration for tearing up the nuclear deal? Well, they haven't been as quick as the UK to actually say, oh, yes, we completely uh, concur with uh, Donald Trump's uh, um, evidence. Um, actually, Germany said, well, uh, we need more evidence. Um, and uh, I don't think uh, President Macron has said anything yet. Um, but actually, it might be Iran, or it might not be Iran. Mm. Um, but all this is the result, I think, of the very undiplomatic 
um, move by uh, Trump to withdraw from the 2015 nuclear deal we had and with, with Iran, which took, which took so many years to actually strike. But how does that relate? Well, because the, I mean, the diplomacy of Trump um, as regard to Iran is all co co coercion, basically. So we're going to cripple your economy, more sanctions, um, and uh, what, what is there for Iran? You know, Iran made a real effort um, in, with, the, with the agreement. It was not a perfect agreement, but it was something. Um, and actually, Iran a few weeks ago, do you remember, said, well, you know, if you are... Uh, really wanting to ruin our economy, we're going to uh, take measures. So perhaps it's those yeah, little so attacks. That question open. And talking about those who leave the question open, um, the opposition in the UK, Jeremy Corbyn, has said we shouldn't be rushing to judgment on this. Um, so where does that leave him? It leaves him making a distinct point. And uh, in my, he'll get criticised for it. But in my view, it's quite healthy. Uh, to have a British political leader not automatically rushing to assume that the US judgment on this is right. Quite unusual in British politics. Normally a Labour leader of the opposition will feel so under pressure to show their, in inverted commas, responsibility to lead as a potential Prime Minister. They would follow the orthodoxy. Corbyn never follows the orthodoxy. Now he gets condemned as being anti-American instinctively and so on. But I think at this point, where the evidence is not definitive, it is very healthy to have a sceptical voice as prominent as the leader of the opposition. And quite unusual, not for him, but in British politics over the last 30 years, where there's an immediate consensus, which often proves to be wrong. And, Diana, I don't want to leave China out of this discussion either, because, of course, you know, global economic superpower, huge growing interests in that region, and both those tankers last week were bound for Asia. So where does China sit on these issues? Well, China is one of the largest importers of oil from Iran. It's a huge customer. And China has always said, in some ways, together with Europe, that when Trump withdrew from the deal, that this was going to happen that the tension will rise in the region. And China has always been against that move. And China, together with South Korea, Japan, had exemption from importing oil up till very recently, November of last year, when Trump canceled that. And so in a way, that was the last lifeline for Iran's economy. Now it's being strangled. So what, it, it, it's not... Uh, out of question that Iran would have to react, and this has been predicted by many countries, China included. OK, and we'll leave that uh, topic there because we're going to come back to the UK now. We are less than one week into the Conservative Party contest to find a new leader and a prime minister to, to lead the country out of its Brexit crisis. But several candidates have already fallen by the wayside. Is the front runner now heading for a coronation? And that's when you, one for you, Steve. The front runner being Boris Johnson, the former foreign secretary and stand up comedian and various other things that he's done at various points. Um, well, he's clearly the front runner. I don't think it will be a coronation. I think the contest has to continue uh, into what becomes the last two candidates, like a who done it going to the party membership. I don't think uh, the party membership want or would allow a coronation before they get the chance for that. Um, but what and I yet, find... of course, that is the speculation this weekend, that in He's Westminster so there are various forces well, it, it, who are saying, let's wrap this up, there's too much blue and blue conflict. It, it, it might happen. They might say, look, that, that just Brexit is so important, let's not extend this unnecessarily. I suspect there will be a contest which goes to the party membership. What I find so interesting about this contest is that uh, more than most leadership contests, all kinds of extraordinarily wild pledges are being made, as if this new prime minister would be elected into a parliament in which he or she could do what they wanted. But what's unusual about this contest is it's taking place in a hung parliament. So the new prime minister will have no control over that parliament. Leading in a hung parliament demands almost impossible skills of patience, of cunning, of charm, of mastery, of detail, of accepting defeats and carrying on. Every Prime Minister who's experienced it go through forms of political hell. 
And it seems to me neither the membership nor the candidates are addressing that context. They're all saying, oh, we'll be out of the EU by the end of October, or, you know, tax cuts here, tax cuts there. It won't get through a hung parliament. Mm. And the skills of a potential leader in that situation have not been tested or even raised as an issue so far in what's been a kind of fantastical contest in the sense that plenty of fantasies are out there. Michael, what's your take? Well, it, it's interesting, Steve talks about this, and, and I think we all, you know, the joke about the unicorns in, in the Brexit deal have now extended to the entirety of, of the leadership contest. And what, what I watch cause, is that we never talk about Jeremy Corbyn when we start talking about Brexit and the, and the Conservative Party, but one of the dynamics that I've noticed is for this system to work, and actually it's true in, in the United States as well, is there has to be a viable opposition. It's, it acts as a buttress to keep the abstracts of our political processes, you know, going like a bicycle, you know, has to turn over, otherwise it falls over. And because of the nature of the Labour Party leadership, that buttressing simply doesn't exist. And so it's, you know, if there was a plausible opposition, you wouldn't have a dozen anybody's contesting this leadership. There'd be one or two plausible candidates because you have a, you know, Labour would be presenting a plausible opposition platform. But because Labour is absent on Brexit, which is the big question confronting the country, he's trying to have it both ways, because Jeremy Corbyn hasn't really built on the surprise result of 2017, it allows the Conservative Party to go off into cloud cuckoo land, which is what it seems like, and you end up with Boris Johnson. And, you know, on this program a year ago, when we had, you know, Conservative voices on, uh, you know, I've been told Boris Johnson will never be Prime Minister because the Parliamentary Party, the Conservative Parliamentary Party, hates him. And here we are a year later, and he's going to be crowned. Agnes. Well... Where do we start? Um, look, there are, there's only one candidate that is facing uh, reality. His uh, name is Rory Stewart. Of course, he doesn't stand a chance of, of being elected as the head. And what do you think is the reality that he's facing in a way that others aren't? Because basically all the others say we're going to renegotiate the withdrawal agreement. This is not going to happen. They, all they can do is to rediscuss the political declaration with Brussels, with the EU. Um, and, um, and Rory Stewart is the only one to say, actually, there is only one withdrawal agreement. He, he, he also is not confrontational. You could see how, although he's a pure Tory, you could see how, perhaps, being very different from Theresa May, it could build a consensus in, in, in Parliament. But anyway, let's not talk about him because he's not going to be elected. Um, and, Boris and, John and obviously Boris Johnson says, just on your point about what's not negotiable, he doesn't believe that because he believes that the closer you get to a possible no deal, then Brussels, um, Brussels will change its mind. Do you think, I mean, Brussels is obviously very familiar with Boris Johnson from various different episodes in his career as, as journalist, as Brexiteer and as foreign secretary. Do you think they think bring it on when they see Boris Johnson uh, so far in the lead or do you think they're brooding and, and, and muttering? I think both. Um, you know, they are bewildered like the rest of us in Europe. Um, and um, this national exercise in self-harming is, is bewildering to watch. Uh, you don't like seeing a friend doing, you know, being uh, um, self-harming, basically. And uh, um, Boris Johnson, the problem is, you know, it's a deadly combination between narcissism and laziness. And you don't get, you don't, you don't achieve anything in politics, especially in negotiating uh, with 27 other members with that quality or, or, or oh, I want to put I want to get Diane in here I mean Agnes um, you know obviously not a big fan of Boris Johnson but his supporters say he will bring energy he will bring charisma well I think the dysfunction of the Tory leadership election it's a reflection of the dysfunction of politics in the country where only one item has been catching attention for the past three years and exhausted everyone's energy. So it becomes who can promise the biggest and the best solution on this one single solution alone. And whether it will be achieved or not, it's completely cast to 
the side. And I think that is the reality that you know, these contexts are representing. And so we're not looking at the quality that required for a PM. Which, in and a way, just just coming back to you, Stephen, we're, we're, we're running short of time at the end now. But, but I mean, these kind of messages suggest that perhaps another few weeks of this contest is not really what the nation or, or what some will want. Well, I think they will, because Theresa May, if you remember, got... Uh, crowned with the thorny crown of prime ministership after a very short contest when she wasn't really tested. And so I think they will continue with the contest. The reason why, I, mean, I did worse than your fellow panellists saying a year ago he wouldn't get it. I wrote a column, so it's probably out there somewhere. Well, that's very honest uh, of you. Saying that I, I thought all the rules of politics suggested he wouldn't get it. But why? I think what's changed, um, that... Just briefly. In, in ten seconds, there was a sort of hysteria around him, and the, where, where there's hysteria, candidates don't tend to win. But what's changed in ten seconds is uh, Donald Trump has given permission for candidates to surface with epic flaws and win. And uh, Nigel Farage is this great campaigner, and they feel specifically on Brexit, and they feel they need uh, a, a winner, in inverted commas, in that context, and they think it's him. So I think those two factors have made him now the clear favourite when a year ago many were saying he wouldn't get to the last two because MPs wouldn't back and him. And there we have to leave it. Thank you all so much. And that is it for Dateline London for this week. We're back next week, same place, same time. Goodbye. Hello. Well, if you like this cool, showery weather, I guess it's good news for you. It looks as though it's going to continue for, for quite some time. Uh, tomorrow might be a little on the chilly side around some western and southern coasts. The breeze is going to pick up uh, coming off the uh, Atlantic. So the low pressure is very much with us today. You can see the clouds circling around the low pressure, weather fronts too. And this pattern has been stuck across the UK for, for a long time now and for as long as this low pressure is here the weather isn't going to change. It's cool across northwestern parts of Europe, central, southern, eastern areas, even Scandinavia at the moment uh, in, in the midst of a uh, relentless uh, heat wave. So through today this is where the showers are around lunchtime, southern parts of the UK nudging into the Midlands, the northwest of England, a few showers in Scotland too. It's been raining so far today across the east of Northern Ireland, but the anticipation is that later on in the day um, it's going to be um, much, uh, much brighter and temperatures will probably get up to around about uh, 19 degrees at best. The showers will continue their journey eastwards through the course of this evening and then uh, later on many of us actually uh, having some clear skies uh, during the evening. Temperatures first thing on Sunday will hover from around about uh, 8 degrees in Belfast to maybe 12 degrees uh, in the um, uh, uh, very far south of the UK there. So Sunday, the low pressure is still with us here, so it's basically like a broken record. Um, the weather fronts keep marching in our direction, so basically that just spells a showery day for, for a lot of us. And here's the breeze then, a southwesterly breeze uh, around western and southern coasts. Frequent clouds and showers moving through. You see plenty of them across uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland too. Temperatures might get up to 20 degrees, but I suspect in the breeze it's going to feel a little bit uh, cooler. Uh, than that. A little change into Monday. Again, lots of showers around. It's just that they'll be in different places. The thinking is probably more frequent showers in Western Scotland and also Northern Ireland, whereas few, fewer showers in, in Wales and England, perhaps a little bit warmer too. Now, the good news is if you want something a little bit warmer, it will be turning a bit warmer during the course of the week. But after that, it looks